Okay, my name is Chester Ritchie. I am head of market development for WorldPay. And I am going to talk to you guys about EMV, but really payment security that EMV is helping usher in today. So last year when we were here, I think we did a survey on how many people had EMV cards in their wallets. And we found out only three of you had EMV cards in your wallets. But just to take a a quick measurement of the industry and the work that we've done this year. Can I see a show of hands for those of you that have an EMV credit card in your wallet today? So look around the room. And you can see we've made some great strides in the industry on the issuing side as far as getting those cards out. We still have some work to do on the merchant side as far as accepting those cards. And how many of you are aware of the October 1st deadline date? That's four weeks away. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so it's coming up and we definitely have some work to do in this area. So does everybody remember this guy? John Dillinger, the most prolific bank robber in the United States of America about 80 years ago. And I love this guy because he had some great quotes. And one of my favorites was, when they arrested him, they asked him, hey, John, how come you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. It's just a great quote. But have you been into a bank recently, in a strip mall center or a grocery store? I mean, the money's not there anymore, right? There's not much there at all. In fact, it is in what we do. Because if you were to break down the US economy, what you find out is 70% of the economy of the United States of America is based on consumer spending. And 70% of that spending is via credit cards. So today, we can say that the money is in what we're doing as a credit card industry, right? And in fact, it is. And it's the reason why we see the big breaches continue to happen. So this almost seems like a weekly occurrence where a big box retailer is being breached. And our personal information as cardholders is being stolen. We're being affected. You know, real people are being hurt by this. So we need to clean up our act as an industry. One of the things that you don't hear on these types of breaches are all the small guys that are also getting breached out there. So to put that in perspective, we saw five, six, seven, eight of these big guys, including the US government, breached this year. But did you know that there was over 20,000 small SMB merchants that were also breached? So using the same tactics that they use on the big boxes, they're using on these small guys. In fact, about two months ago, there was a point of sale system from a solution provider that was breached. They did a diligent job. They figured out there was a breach in their software. But within a week of them finding that out, over 1,800 small restaurants, small businesses, mom and pops were breached. Many of those guys out of business after the breach because they can't incur the financial penalties and everything else that goes along with the breach. So we didn't have tools in the past to really protect against that, but now we do today. And my point here today in taking you through this is to really say as a solution provider or as a merchant, you know, you need to make sure that your payment solution is secure because we're all part of the same ecosystem and there is no governing body. So anytime you see a breach out there, you should actually get upset because what's happening is your own livelihood's being affected because eventually if this continues to happen, we will see the government regulate and we'll all be effective negatively as a result of that. Now, some of the tools that we have at our disposal today is both in the online world and the physical world. But on the online or on the physical side, we're starting to see EMV and talk about EMV. So Larry and I were just talking and he said he's gonna make fun of it tomorrow. So <laughs> EMV's definitely got his detractors out there. I happen to love EMV and the reason I love it is because as an industry, it is the first tool that we've offered, you know, as an industry to help protect cardholder data. Now, ENV by itself won't give you that overall protection. It's only gonna protect you or your customers or your merchants from counterfeit credit cards. But as you're going through this technology refresh for the October 1st deadline date, the real ENV solution should be what we call the trifecta solution. This is the way we sell it at WorldPay, and I know if Bob's in the room, Heartland was also a big proponent of this. But we sell ENV with coupled with point-to-point -point encryption and tokenization. Because if you think about EMV, the only thing EMV does is it puts a password on the end of the credit card transaction. So that's that little cryptogram thing we're talking about with the chips generating. 
the cardholder information is still being transmitted in the clear. And that's what these bad guys know how to access and breach. So you want to make sure you, you clear that up. Point-to-point -point encryption right on the read head. It's pretty good stuff. Whenever you see the FBI and the CIA complaining to Congress that they need to create backdoors for current encryption because they can't break it, it's pretty good encryption. And still, so far today, we haven't seen anyone breach that encryption. So again, protect yourself, protect your merchants by employing the full suite. On the card not present side, what we call e-com and mobile payments, things that we're talking about here today, the legacy gateways that are out there were primarily concerned with processing and payment. Many of them are not secure. So you definitely want to be looking at payment or gateway 2.0 companies, or if you're with an existing gateway, if they offer you tools for point-to-point -point encryption and tokenization and vaulting, you want to start taking care and implementing those solutions as well. I call out vaulting separately because the vaults that we see out there today from solution providers, uh, let me tell you, it's pretty scary. A lot of these legacy systems, their ideals of a vault are things like Microsoft Notepad. And I kid you not, they'll load up a notepad or a text file with credit card numbers and transmit it to us to be processed over the wide over internet and that's happening day in and day out. I walked into a tanning salon. Unfortunately, my wife owned it. <laughs> and the tanning salon system that submits your, your monthly membership file to be processed monthly, uh, she had a problem with her computer, so I walked in and there was literally over a thousand Microsoft Notepad files full of credit card information on the desktop. So now think about it, you, you know, you, you hire teenagers to run those places. I mean, that's where our credit cards are going, folks, and the reason why they're being breached left and right, because, again, these are unsecure systems. The third tool that we have out there is PCI Compliance 3.0. Again, usually lots of groans in the room about PCI, because 3.0 is pretty stringent. We're the first processor to obtain a rock with PCI 3.0. We just completed that last month. And uh, let me tell you, it's not pretty, because what you're doing with PCI 3.0 is you're removing all PAN or personal cardholder data from your external systems and then also your internal systems. So you're protecting yourself from external threats and also internal threats, which are your employees, right? But if you think about taking out that PAN data from your existing systems, we had to go back and retrofit our ERP systems, our CRM systems, our customer service systems. And uh, you know some of that doesn't work so well when you first try to do it. So you're gonna have a couple iterations of that because you'll realize that you do rely on that information a lot, you know, especially as a provider a lot of times. Okay, now in the physical world, so let, let's look at how we've done it with EMV over the last year. So if you remember last year, pretty much the rest of the world is all EMV compliant. United States was the last holdout. You get into places like Europe, we're almost at 100% adoption, or down in Latin America or Canada, we're in the 90% range. The United States last year was a third of 1% of all transactions were EMV compliant. So how do we do this year, since we have a deadline date coming up? Well, at the end of 2014, we're now at a 12th of 1%. So we did great. We quadrupled our efforts in the United States of America. Should all flat ourselves for that. But obviously, we got lots more work to do here, right? <laughs> so we have an October 1st deadline date, and we fully expect that 40% of all the transactions in the US will be EMV compliant. So how is that possible, you may be asking? Anybody shop at Walmart? How many people shop at Walmart? Anybody shop at Walmart in the last couple of weeks, last few weeks, you notice that now if you have an EMV card, you're dipping it. So Walmart has flipped it on in the last month. Target has flipped it on in the last month. These are the entities that run the majority of the transactions in the US. So just by onboarding a few of the big boxes, we'll get to that 40% range. What we won't get to is integrated systems because as we look around the industry and we deal with different partners and solution providers, what we're finding is many people don't, still don't have their solutions yet. They haven't shipped them. They're on a roadmap and many of those are targeted for October 1st, but that's the solution provider's ship date. Now, if you think about it, they have to then sell that to a customer, and usually the customer has to upgrade their point of sale system to account for the new addition, 
we're getting into the holidays, so nobody's going to upgrade their systems and risk that. So really, we're looking at a Q1, Q2, Q3 next year for integrated systems on the SMB side. Now, a lot of people are getting concerned about that, especially on the small business side. You know, they're all like, hey, how can you have this mandate and shift liability when you don't even have a solution? And I always tell them, it's kind of like homework, you know? They gave you a month, two weeks to do your homework. I mean, when did you actually do the homework? You did it the night before, right? And that's just human nature. So that's the same thing that we're seeing with the EMV. And again, the people that should really be concerned about this right out of the gate are the big boxes. So the electronic retailers, the high ticket retailers, people that sell gift cards, because that's how they monetize these data breaches. A restaurant right out of the gate, Larry and I were just talking about this. Some guys, you know, they're starting to do those economic analysis. Hey, I sell a dollar fifty cup of coffee, you know, what's my exposure? Well, right out of the gate, not a lot, but again, because you're continuing to transmit cardholder data in the clear, it will be a lot. And the other thing that we've noticed with the EMV around the rest of the world is for the people that don't implement EMV their fraud continues to go up because fraud always migrates to the least secure. Your fraud rates will continue to increase until you cry uncle and you finally implement EMV and encryption and tokenization, things like that. This is why I say that. So I don't know if you guys remember this, this chart from last year, but this is a real-time security chart from a company called Norse. This is a product called IP Viking. This shows real-time hacking attempts as they're happening. See where they're all coming into? The United States of America from all over the world, right? And again, the reason for that is we're the last holdout for EMV. The rest of the world has already implemented EMV, so it's much easier for these guys to hack our systems because they're wide open today. This is what you're up against if you're a small retailer. This is what you're up against if you're a big box retailer. So why can't the big box guys protect themselves when they have $100 million IT budgets? Well, if you look at the chart of the domain names that are initiating those attacks in the lower left-hand corner, what you'll see is the domains end in suffixes like .mil and .gov. So we have state-sponsored hacking going on in other parts of the world because that they know that's how they can monetize these breaches. So, you know, you're up against governments. You're not up against Johnny working out of his bedroom. And again, that's what for us to get EMV in the United States because this is what's going on. We call it the invisible war, but those guys are out there day in and day out. Now, an interesting is, thing is about to happen for you that are doing CNP transactions, so card not tr uh, present transactions, both e-com and mobile, is your fraud rates are about to go up. Why? Because fraud always migrates to the least secure, right? So what we're looking at on this graph here is this is the way it looked in the UK. As we lock down physical retail, what you'll see on the vertical access lines here in green, are those are the different dates that we started to implement EMV and then we had 100% EMV adoption. The blue line is physical card fraud. And as you can notice, as soon as we implement EMV, we start to see those fraud levels go down. EMV, very, very effective. We see fraud levels decrease by a little over 80%, like immediately. But the other thing we noticed is overall fraud didn't necessarily go down a whole lot. So what was going on there? Well, it was simply migrating to CNP transactions because again, you're not able to use those EMV cards for mobile payments or e-com because you don't have the physical card or the chip. So those fraudsters just simply went over to CNP transactions and we started to see CNP transactions increase. That's happened time and time again for every single country that we rolled EMV out for. Now in the US with these Gateway 2.0 companies, we have better tools than they did back in those days. So we think we can mitigate some of this. But again, just expect that in the back of your mind that you definitely want to look into starting to implement those tools because this is what's about to happen to you. Okay, on the Gateway 2.0 companies, here's a couple things that they add which are pretty, what I think are pretty cool is you definitely get the vaulting and the encryption and the tokenization. So again, today, if your gateway is not providing that to you, you want to look into a gateway that does. Basically, if you're providing payments in the online world, you want to make sure you as a solution provider never touch that cardholder data 
never store that cardholder data. Let someone else do it, a processor like us, because we have those tools today. And when I say us, it's processors as an industry, because what we're trying to do is take away the economics for a, a bad guy to breach you or breach a merchant. So rather than you having the data, you know, put that data up on our systems, because we do have the tools to help protect against that. On the fraud detection side, in addition to some of these these hacking tools that we see out there. Some of these systems are really, really sophisticated where they do things like they have 1,800, 2,000 honeypot sites around the world and uh, they trade in what they call carding information. And they don't necessarily trade that information, but what they're doing is they're collecting bad IP addresses for people that do visit those, those types of sites. And they will block those guys from your e-com sites, from your mobile sites before they even get to you. So pretty sophisticated the way that they go about you know, attacking the dark web and keeping these guys at bay from you, in addition to velocity checks and bad domain IPs and things like that. In addition to that, how many of you implement 3D Secure? Anybody using 3D Secure today? Okay, so we got one guy. 3D Secure 2.0 will roll out next year. And again, in some of the gateways today, they're able to mask the complexities of 3D Secure for you. But what 3D Secure is basically authenticates that the person that's using a credit card on your site is actually the card holder. So it helps with that. You can get some interchange relief with that. And again, it can guarantee you that that is an authentic transaction. A Gateway 2.0 company can provide that functionality for you. The other thing I like about them is they also provide enriched data sets. So traditionally, when we look at application development, we look at it with three layers. So at the bottom, you have the settlement layer, which is the data that processors, guys like us, provide in-house for you. Then there was a connectivity layer, which are the gateways. And then above that is the presentation layer, which are you know the Ubers of the world, these guys that are able to create these just awesome consumer applications that use that connectivity layer because it's very easy to plug into the settlement layer, which is us. Now that those extra data sets that they use, they traditionally stored that information themselves. So again, and usually not in very secure environments. But with these new gateways, you can store that information up in the cloud, let us take responsibility of it for you, and it's gonna be totally secure. A great example of this right now that's happening is um, the Ashley Madison breach that you see going on. So it ruins a lot of lives because there's a lot of data out there. But if you notice, no payment data was breached. It's only personal information for the people that actually subscribe to the site. And the reason they're able to do that is they're splitting out the information, so enriched data versus the settlement data. So if they were using one of these new gateways where the processor or the gateway 2.0 company is storing it all for them, you know, they wouldn't experience something like that. Another great example is the company on the bottom left hand side is Notice Technologies. So this is a partner of ours. They are a gateway 2.0 company. They use some of this technology. But if you're doing online payments with four lines of code, you can add payments to your solution using Notice. And Again, they keep the, the data, the payment data totally separate from you, so you don't have to worry about being, being damaged. But the other thing they do is they're able to process that transaction, use additional data like SKU data, customer data, and then they write back that transactional data into your accounting's ERP system automatically. So just by using their payment technology, you know, you're doing the entire accounting function as well. So very, very slick technology that you won't get just from a traditional retailer or uh, processor. But these guys using the technology this way will help keep you protected and give you all that additional functionality as well. So pretty cool stuff. Okay, I want to make sure you guys know about our industry associations. Now it's more important than ever. You know, payments was pretty easy before. It, it, Larry kept throwing around $20 bill. That's how easy it was in the past. <laughs> it's fairly sophisticated nowadays, right? So our associations, how many of you are members of ETA? Okay, so maybe 10 people in the room. 
Okay, so again, that's our industry association. And the reason I want to bring it up is great trade shows, great continuing education, things like that. But they're also our voice on the heel. So there are our, lobby, our, lobby, our lobbyists up in Washington. The reason I'm bringing that up is, again, because of these breaches, there's lots of legislation that continues to pop up in Washington. Because anytime you're, you have consumers being harmed, usually the government's going to regulate to protect consumers, right? One recent lawsuit, which we're really fighting against right now, is there was a fraudulent merchant last year and the FTC came in and they sued not only that merchant, but the, sol the solution provider, the ISO, the processor, and the sponsoring bank. So everyone in the payment ecosystem, because the FTC, FTC is using a new term called willful ignorance. So if you're a solution provider and you're allowing someone to download your app, which processes a payment, and you don't know exactly what that guy's doing, you're being willfully ignorant and you can be held liable. So it's good for all of us in this room to make sure we're keeping abreast of ETA and this legislation and supporting them because again, they are our lobbying arm. To give you another example of that, we're doing a, what we call a fly-in in DC on Capitol Hill in two weeks where we meet with all the, the senators and we have a payment subcommittee now and things like that. So really a great advocate for the industry. The other company is EMV Co. Anyone a member of EMV Co.? Okay, so three, a few people. EMV Co. is the, the joint venture company owned by the major card brands. Great information up there. So if you've never been to their site or you don't look at their technical specs or documentation, definitely go up to EMV Co. and get that because it, it's free up there for you to, to receive. The reason I bring them up is because if you think about the payments ecosystem, it's pretty large and sophisticated, but there's no single government entity, there's no single company that controls it or regulates it or sets the rules for us, right? Something like ENV, some people will say in the US that, hey, that's old outdated technology, we should add this, that, and the other thing to it. The government should regulate EMV. And it, the first question that pops up normally is, well, which government, right? Because ENV is an international standard, not just a national standard. So no, no government like the US government can come in and regulate it. The other things that we get up at EMV Co. is we have gotten the EMV spec, so we've defined it up there. The spec for tokenization and the standard for tokenization is up there as well. Visa has just graciously donated the 3D Secure 1.0 spec to EMV Co. And we're going to pick it up and roll out 3D Secure 2.0 this year. So we'll take away those friction points of how people experience it today and make it more of an iframe, you know, very frictionless type of solution for everyone going forward in the future. And my hope is this year sometime will also be the, the governing body for encryption as well. So there'll be a standard for encryption up there. But lots of great information up there for you to log into. And again, it's available for any anyone that's part of the ecosystem. Okay, so I want to tell you guys a, a quick story here. About five years ago, there was a processor that was breached. They find the process, the, the hacker is an Eastern European hacker, Interpol tracks him down, arrests him, throws him in prison. Five years goes by, this guy gets out of prison and within a week, that same processor start seeing the same type of probes and hacks that that guy had initiated on them. So they have Interpol pick him up, and sure enough, it's this guy again. He's right back at it. So they ask him, you know, why? Why would you do this? And literally his response was, that's because we're, that's where the money is. That's what this guy knows how to do. So the point here is not about that guy being a knucklehead, because he is, but the point is, in that meantime, <clears throat> the processor was able to utilize these tools that we just looked at to help protect cardholder data and therefore protect themselves. And I would ask the same of all of us in this room today because if you're putting on a system that isn't secure, you're complicit in the breach of cardholder data and you're also complicit in hurting each one of us that are part of this industry. So again, my name is Chester Ritchie. We have a booth in the, the hall here with WorldPay. So if you have any questions, I'll be over there to answer those for you. Thank you.